Good afternoon. This is Dyke Hendrickson, and this is the podcast Life Along the Merrimack. Each week, we spend about a half hour talking about the health and history of the Merrimack River. And today, we're going to be talking about Atlantic women. And the reason we're going to be talking about this subject is because of the realities of history, there aren't too many women um, in the 18th and 19th centuries who got themselves into the history books. But I have recently come across a very interesting woman named Annie Brown. If you're watching, her photo is here. If you're not, let me just tell, me, tell you some very interesting things about Annie Brown. I am doing a book on the Plum Island titled Plum Island, A Vulnerable Gem. And as you know, a very large part of Plum Island is the wildlife refuge at the south of the island. The refuge is about six miles long and well known for its beautiful beaches, lovely dunes, many, many green heads and terrific birding. And we have the Federal Wildlife Refuge in large part because of this woman, Annie Brown. She lived in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And in 1928, she gave a good part of her estate to create a federal wildlife refuge. She was a very wealthy woman. She lived in Stoneham. She was a bird watcher, ardent lover of birds, she was part of the Audubon Society. And in, in about the 1920s um, in Plum Island, there had been many discussions about putting houses on Plum Island. Of course, in the northern end, there were many cottages. But to the southern end, there were houses, there were cottages. Grape Island is one of the places. But a lot of people wanted to have a preserve for birds. Uh, federal officials had said it was an important stopping point for birds on their migrations. So they wanted to somehow secure this land so that the birders could have their avocation and many, many fine birds could come to Plum Island. So Annie Brown was a longtime member of the Audubon Society, and she be gave $25,000 to the Federated bird clubs of New England. And I'll just read this. After several months of negotiations, the executors of her estate and the officers of the Federation selected a parcel of three parcel of 300 acres of the beach, dunes, and salt marsh near the southern end of Plum Island as the core of the new bird sanctuary. Soon after the initial purchase, two more tracts of land were added, bringing the total area to about 600 acres. Now, she passed away in about 1929. Her will was adjudicated. Um, the land was purchased, and some of the bird federations got together. Um, they, the Audubon Society, in about 1938, decided to come together with the Federal Wildlife Refuge, and in 1942, the Annie B Brown Sanctuary which consisted of about a thousand acres by this time, was created. And from that, the federal government took over as the Federal Wildlife Refuge, which we have today. So that is my story. Here is her photo. And she was a very valuable asset to bird watchers, um, to Plum Island, um, to the birds themselves. And I say this because I think we know that the northern end of the island has become very built up in recent years. You have to have a great deal of money to purchase a house there, probably at least a million dollars. But Annie Brown, way back in 1928, gave a great deal of money so that a bird sanctuary could be created. So that is my good story for the day. I'm gonna talk about some more women of the Atlantic, some more history makers, but Annie Brown is my hero for the day. Here, we're gonna talk about some women over the years. This is a um, picture of a statue of Hannah Dustin. This is in Haverhill. She goes way, way back. 
it's a legend and it's still well known because of this statue and many signs in Haverhill and in New Hampshire. Hannah Dustin in about 1697 uh, was a wife and mother and she was kidnapped by Native Americans in the area of Haverhill and they were taking her up the Merrimack River towards New Hampshire. Now Hannah evidently had a lot of energy. She had a little bloodthirsty streak in her evidently. And while the Native Americans were sleeping, once they got to New Hampshire, she took an ax and she killed about 10 Native Americans. And she and her partner, um, another woman from the community and one of their children stole off into the night. They actually had the presence of mind to take scalps. And so she actually made some money on the deal, according to legend, because in those days, 1697, um, the authorities were paying for scalps of Native Americans. So this is a bit weird because we love Native Americans. We love women of the frontier. And at the time, New England was part of the frontier. But Hannah did, you know, put away the lives of about a dozen Native Americans. But, you know, there, this must be a trade-off. They were going to capture her, take her to Quebec, sell her and her children as a her child as a slave and her friend as a slave to the French Canadians. So she protected her life. But there it is. If you ever go through Haverhill and see this statue, it is of Hannah Dustin. Here is a, another hero of mine, Ellen Swallow Richards. She was the first woman graduate of MIT in about 1882. Her field was water and drinking water. Now, her maiden name was Ellen Swallow, which is a good name to have if you're going into the drinking water business. Her husband, was Professor Richards, so she became Ellen Swallow Richards. But in the 1890s, there was um, numerous outbreaks of typhoid in areas such as Lawrence. Now, of course, people got their drinking water from the Merrimack, and it was cleansed, or so they thought. But these deaths because of typhoid was of great concern, and a state panel was created to go to Lawrence and see what was happening. Ellen Swallow Richards was one of the scientists that went there. She created a new scientific approach to cleaning the water, and it turned out to be much more effective. It was later used in Lowell and in Haverhill, and was picked up in other communities around the country. So she was very much a pioneer of clean drinking water and saved many lives. Now, in those days, the poorer people lived closer to the river, and the wealthier people, people lived distant. A wealthy person living a mile away from downtown Lawrence or downtown Haverhill would probably have their own well, so they were not damaged by bad drinking water. But the people near the river, at least until about 1890, got their water directly from the river. Many of them got sick until Ellen Swallow Richards came along. And she was really a versatile and brilliant woman. She, in addition, she is known as the mother of home economics. And she lived in Cambridge and she would give lectures or go to people's homes and talk about the value of a clean kitchen, the value of balanced meals, the value of eating fruits and vegetables. She also, was a professional among professionals and created with other women the organization that was later called the American Association of University Women, the AAUW. She had enough credits to graduate from MIT with a graduate degree, but in the 1880s, MIT did not give graduate degrees to women. But she was the first woman graduate of MIT. She was a luminary in the area of drinking water. And I put her in my unofficial hall of fame of women who have made a good difference in New England and American history. 
Now, if you're listening, this is Life Along the Merrimack, 96.3 Joppa Radio and Channel 9 Local Cable TV. Here is another um, pioneer, Ida Berg. She was lived in a lighthouse off of Newport, Rhode Island. And she was one of the first rescuers in the Rhode Island area. Now, women did not generally rescue people. There were many on land that did, and they were men. But Ida lived in the lighthouse with her family and became a legend in the Newport area for when boats were having trouble, she and others would get in a, a big boat and life jackets and, th- and cork jackets, actually, and go out and save people. So she is a great legend in the Newport area. Here are women from Second World War. They were called spars. When the war broke out, there were very few women in the Coast Guard, but it became apparent that they needed more women for clerical work, for communications work. And these were spars, and they were volunteers with the Coast Guard. During the World War II, the spars numbered almost 12,000. And if you consider they went from 100 to 12,000 in four years. If you're in the administration business, you can realize that that's a great deal of work. The spars were very helpful and really um, did a good turn for the Coast Guard. Today, there are about 92,000 actives and reserves in the US Coast Guard. I know this because I wrote a book titled New England Coast Guard Stories. And seeing these pictures of women in the spars was inspiring. They were very helpful. And one thing that's not generally known is spars were very good in communications and helping to break the codes of the Germans and the Japanese. And this is how it happened. In the 1920s, there were many um, rum rum runners in New England. These people would bring whiskey and beer, drop it off in Plum Island or elsewhere, and they make a lot of money. The Coast Guard was charged with stopping this smuggling of alcohol. It was very difficult. And actually, the gangs of smugglers had codes, and one boat would talk to another. And so the Coast Guard was among the first people who were assigned to break the codes of these smugglers, and they did. So then, as we got closer to World War II in the late 30s, um, the the alcohol smuggling was over, but we were concerned about Japanese and German codes. So the people came to the Coast Guard and started asking them about codes. And so the women of the Coast Guard knew a lot about that. The Navy eventually took over the program but I am biased towards the Coast Guard. They were among the first code breakers in World War II. Here's a a, a woman from my Coast Guard book, Megan Cahoon. She was in Rockland, Maine. If you're watching, you can see there, she's standing in front of a sign, United States Coast Guard in Rockland, Maine. And she's an example of kind of a new kind of Coast Guard recruit. She went to Ohio Wesleyan University. She wants to be a teacher. When I met her several years ago in Rockland, she was the only woman in the Rockland contingent. There are 32 men and Megan Cahoon. And I asked her, geez, is this a problem? You know, with so many men, as some of you may well know, men can be obnoxious, particularly men in groups. And she said she hadn't had trouble. She lived in her own apartment, so that wasn't a dorm situation. And she said when people were on the job, it was pretty professional. But Megan Cahoon was an example, is an example of a new Coast Guard member. And uh, she wants to put some time in the Coast Guard and then start a career in teaching. Here's a picture of the local Congresswoman, Lori Trahan. She 
uh, represents the Lowell area. I believe she lives in Chelmsford. She is part of a group of um, legislators who are trying to improve the sewage treatment plants on the Merrimack River. The Boston Globe had a huge story on the Merrimack River on Saturday. And of course, I was in the newspaper business for many years. People say no one reads the Saturday edition. So I will tell you what the Globe was saying. And it coincides with what Lori Prahan, the Congresswoman, is doing. Many of the large cities on the Merrimack, Haverhill, Lawrence, Lowell, and uh, Manchester, have large sewage treatment plants along the river. They're, the sewage goes into the sewage treatment plant, which is treated, of course, but also pipes from the rain runoff also go into these sewage treatment plants. So when you're having a dry day, life is good. When you're having downpours, as we had recently in early July, the rainwater goes into the sewage treatment plants and the plant can't hold all of that volume. So everything is released. Millions of gallons of effluent go into the Merrimack River. Now this is known and the Environmental Protection Agency knows it, the state officials know it, but this is really one of the things that folks are trying to do. And the Globe story uh, reported that people like Lori Trahan and Seth Moulton, the congressman from the North Shore of Massachusetts, are trying to get money to improve these sewage treatment plants so the CSOs will stop. Now, the Clean Water Act of 1972, pioneered by Senator Edmund Muskie, gave grants to cities, and that's how a lot of sewage treatment plants were built. In 1987, President Reagan didn't want to do that anymore. And he said, we're getting rid of these grants to sewage treatment plants. They should pay for their own. But of course, they're usually expensive and most communities, mill communities couldn't do it. So Senator George Mitchell, also from Maine said, well, let us have low interest loans and we will improve treatment plants with loans. And so that bill and that um, enabling legislation still exists, and Lori Trahan is trying to get her hold on low interest money, 1.5%. That is very good. And if you've watched the news or have kept up with it, uh, Pre President Biden's infrastructure plan permits millions of dollars to come to Massachusetts, and Governor Charlie Baker wants to take some of that money. He hasn't said how much maybe 50 million, maybe up to 100 million, and put it towards rivers, particularly the Merrimack River. So what that would mean is this pool of millions would be available for Lowell, Lawrence, Haverhill, because they're under agreement with the feds to improve. They could go to the federal government, get loans, and improve their sewage treatment plants. So that's where Congresswoman Trahan comes in Seth Moulton's doing the same thing as well as others, but that's on the table right now. Charlie Baker, our governor, is trying to get that money released and send some of it to the Merrimack River. Donna Holliday, if you're listening and not watching, is the mayor of Newburyport. <coughs> she has done a great deal to help the cleaning of rivers. Um, specifically, she has urged a plan that calls on sewage treatment plants upriver to warn the cities downriver when there's been a CSO or a discharge of effluent into the river. I remember I was with the Daily News as a reporter from 2012 to 2017, and I remember going out and ride with her and Tony Fernari who is the public works director in Newburyport after like five days of rain in the spring. And the Merrimack River was brown. It was all the CSOs had come forth and it was terrible. And so obviously it was cold, so no one was swimming. 
But it was a situation where that I think that inspired her to, you know, to write letters to Lowell, Lawrence, Haberl. She couldn't really have much influence in Manchester. It's in New Hampshire. But she said, can you please try to clean up the CSOs? We are the last stop downriver and we are really effective. Now, in the past early July, we've had numerous C CSOs, that meaning influence, effluent getting into the river. And I don't know if the word has gotten out. Now, it hasn't rained for several days, but I was on the river yesterday. Well, not on, I was adjacent to the river. And there were six or eight girls on paddle boards. I say girls are 12 to 14, quite young. And then several women were on paddling in an upright position. And so I'm just curious if they knew that there had been effluent in the river just two or three days earlier. If they had known, perhaps they wouldn't have gone in. I would say I'm rather amazed also by the site, the site in the river, the girls and young women. Very few of them had um, life preservers on. And this is a real no-no. I know this because, you know, I wrote that Coast Guard book. And one of the biggest um, imperatives for the Coast Guard is to get people to put life preservers on. And so you'll see many people, you know, jet skiing or in kayaks. Actually, kayaks, kayakers usually have life preservers. But they're really very important. There's several drownings each year in the Merrimack River. And in most cases, people were not wearing life preservers. So as we talk about the river, I would mention, if you're listening, this is Life Along the Merrimack, a weekly podcast. I am Dyke Hendrickson, and this is 96.3 Joppa Radio and Channel 9 Cable TV. Here's one of my favorite photos. It doesn't exactly link up to the river, but, um, it reminds me of um, many of the stories of Newburyport and the fishing industry. If you're listening and not watching, this is a picture taken in about 1850 of the female high school in Newburyport. It is there are about 40 girls in front of a large building. It looks like it's winter because <laughs> there are no leaves on the trees. But it's a, an interesting photo because from 1844 to about 1858, um, the female high school served Newburyport. It's supposedly the first or among the first high schools in the country just for females. Now I should qualify that. There were many schools for females, even in the 1700s and 1800s. But they were like, they were for French or they were for English, or they were for dancing. But they were, you had to pay for them. The girls, the female high school in Newburyport was among the first that were propelled by taxpayer money. And uh, this was a little unusual. Actually, it's very unusual. Um, but the fathers, I say fathers, all the counselors, but city fathers were men. But they said, well, we know we need another high school um, and we're gonna put tax money towards a female high school. One reason that Newburyport uh, wanted this kind of high school is there were many, many orphans in Newburyport in the say mid 19th century. And again, we're talking 1844 to 1858 for this school. There were many fishermen in Newburyport, which means many were lost at sea. Uh, so, far, so much later, few of us realized how many fishermen were lost at sea. There was something called the Yankee Gale, just an example in 1852. And all along New England, boats were always out fishing. And there were hundreds of them at a given time. They would go, some stayed on day trips, but others went for several weeks. <coughs> Excuse me. And in 1852, hundreds of vessels were out. 
a storm came up and 92 ships were lost among the North Shore. And 24 of those vessels were from Newburyport. Can, you can imagine that. So there are probably six to 10 people on each vessel. I'm, and I'm talking now about the vessel may have been 30, 40 feet long. They would have several rowboats. The rowboats would go out and set lines. They would come back uh, at the end of the day. And then the next day they would go out and pick up their lines. But, you know, you're think, thinking six to 10 people, maybe more in each vessel. So if you lost 24 of those vessels from Newburyport alone, you're talking a tremendous loss in terms of fathers, sons, husbands. Um, they were gone. So you suddenly had, you know, a hole in the economy for, and certainly families were going to be without money, uh, perhaps without food. And so Newburyport wasn't separate in this sense. Other communities lost uh, ships as well. Um, Gloucester, for instance, had uh, was a larger city than Newburyport, and it had more fishing vessels. They would lose, you know, twenty to fifty men a year just the, because they had so many vessels out there. And this was a period before a lot of families had life insurance. Um, the governments at that time did not compensate families, like say workers' compensation that we have now, or um, insurance that would make sure, social security that would make sure that some families were safe. This did not exist at that time. So what we're talking about, the fishing industry was very dangerous. Also, and I would mention just on the subject of the female high school, it was closed in about 1858 or so because it was consolidated with other schools. It burnt down in the 1860s. Um, it was an arson, I don't believe. But one of the great institutions of the past, I must say, was fire. This was located on Washington Street. Um, eventually, the railroad station was built there. It's... Uh, you know, Washington Street kind of halfway down the way, uh, Washington and maybe Winter Street in that area. So that's where it was. It's no longer there. But this photo shows it was a vibrant school. And um, boy, did those girls and teachers get dressed up. If you're listening and not watching, I would mention all the, you know, they have long skirts down to the ground. The women girls or women, depending. I can't see if they're teachers or students, but most of them have hats on, they're well groomed, and it's a wonderful photo. So those are a couple of stories I had about um, women of the Atlantic, I'm ca calling it. It starts with Annie Brown, who I just discovered because my next book is titled Plum Island, A Vulnerable Gem. And also, just to bring to light some women, um, Congresswoman Lori Trahan, Mayor Donna Holliday are working very hard for a clean river. There are other people like uh, Ellen Swallow Richards, who is a scientist who brought clean water to the Merrimack. And before I leave, I would mention the Merrimack River, five, more than 500,000 people still get their drinking water from the Merrimack River. So it behooves all of us to make sure the water has good science behind it. Now, Newburyport does not get its drinking water from the Merrimack River, but the communities upriver do, and for that reason, it'll always be important. So that's it for me. I'm Dyke Hendrickson. This is Life Along the Merrimack. This is 96.3 FM radio, Joppa radio, local channel nine cable TV. Thank you for being with us. We'll be back next Tuesday during Yankee Homecoming and we will be talking more about life along the Merrimack. Thank you very much.